scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book, book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. Mark 8, 34 through 38. When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I um, got to preach last week in Dover, which is where I grew up, and they're in the process of looking for a minister, and so I was kind of filling in until they have appointments to get with people, and I was fortunate enough to have um, two of uh, my daughters and uh, son there, and uh, I said that to say this. Uh, sometimes, uh, I hope in the mornings when I'm preaching, uh, if I see you and don't say anything, that uh, y- you don't take it personal because there's, there's, a, there's a fine line between being ready for me to preach and, and then seeing people that you really care about and you love and, 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 and get that lump in your throat that you can't, you can't get out and talk like you want to talk. So I just want you to know uh, how much I appreciate uh, being able to be here and to share with you from from God's word. I am grateful and thankful for the many people in this congregation who do so much that most of us don't know about, um, especially even the men who lead in public uh, in a way to help us all uh, serve our God and worship him and encourage one another uh, in the best way we can. So I just want to say thank you uh, to those who do that. Um, As always, if you are visiting, um, we are glad you're here and um, You are certainly, as was said before, our guest, and we appreciate that. And as usual, if uh, you are a member of the Lord's body, uh, we are glad you're here, but we expect you to be here just like you do us, because it is a great, great, great source of encouragement. Not too long ago, there was a marketing campaign by MasterCard. It's still running. I don't know how many new card members it generated, Nor do I know how many of you went out and used your card uh, more than you normally do. But I do know that their commercials caused us to stop and think like not many commercials do. The very first priceless commercial was in 1997. And here it is. A dad takes his son to a baseball game and pays for a hot dog and a drink. But the conversation between the two of them is priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. You know, you could take that same ideology, now I'm gonna go from a lofty spot to a low spot real fast here, and watch this. There there was a husband or a wife who took their mate to the movie and spent $10 each on a ticket, $10 on one bag of popcorn, $10 on a drink, and $10 on a candy, and MasterCard could take care of the 50 bucks, but the time that they spent together was priceless. Everything else, MasterCard can handle. The idea is is that we understand the importance of spending and giving of our means for specific things. But normally, it comes back to what we were able to do with the people, usually, 
and using those means. This morning, we're going to look at a, I'm, I'm going to take the long way around. I'm going to tell you that now, but we're going to get to a question that I, man, it, 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 it changed my whole life. This, this question did. I, I, I was not looking for this question. Uh, I was not looking to be changed in this manner. Uh, but when this question hit me between the eyes, I, I have never, ever been the same. But to get there, here's how we're going to do it. The value of great questions. Uh, this morning, I'd like to look at one of the greatest questions ever asked by Christ, the Son of the living God. It was in our reading uh, that was just read. Jesus asked many great questions. Matter of fact, if you really study the Gospels, Jesus actually asked more questions than he answered, even when people ask him questions. Um, so our goal this morning uh, is to look at the setting in which we find this life-changing and provoking question um, and see how that might affect us personally. So here we go. Jesus' fame is growing. He's coming down to the final almost weeks in, in his ministry. Started off with 12, then he sent out the 70. Now he's got disciples everywhere. He's fed 5,000. A little bit later, he feeds 4,000. He's demonstrating his kingly and holy powers for the good of mankind, carrying out God's will. He is fulfilling his purpose. He is carrying out his mission. He has taught as no other man has taught. Yes, he and he alone can lead us to the Father, the only true living creator of heaven and earth and all that lies within them. When Jesus is in prison, when John the Baptist, I'm sorry, is in prison, and he's not exactly sure on what's going on. You know, his faith is getting tried a little bit. I don't know that he ever expected to really be in prison for Jesus, but here's kind of how the conversation goes. It's John the Baptist is coming down the stretch. It says, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went out from there to teach and to preach in the cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. That's Jesus' answer to John the Baptist, and I'm sure that it sufficed. If you remember, sometimes the scribes and the Pharisees used to come to Jesus and ask him for a sign. And what he said to them was, is that really, he said, there would be no sign given to this adulterous generation. You're evil. He says, however, the sign of Jonah, the son of man will be in the belly of the great fish, like will be in the, in, the earth, in the earth like Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, and in three days he will rise again. And then another time he said that destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, What's, it took 46 years to build that temple. And then it goes on to say that Jesus explained to his disciples that he was talking about his body. And then it says that they remembered that after he was raised. I, I know I've said this before, but when, when you stop and think about Jesus' mission and what he's trying to do, it's no easy task. He's trying to prepare men and women to carry on by faith in him, and yet he suffers this horrible, cruel death at the hands of what looks like the enemies. And somehow, they're supposed to be sustained through this just enough to make it through the three to four days till he comes back to sustain them. No easy task. As I said before, we always look back on it in hindsight. The strange thing about hindsight is it's not 2020, it's x-ray. I mean, you look back and see things that didn't even actually exist. But when you're coming into it, it's a whole other story. We do that with people we know and love, don't we? We, we, we know people who come up to a point in life and we know it's going to be okay, but they've never been there before. And they're fearful. They don't know, but we know they're going to be okay because we know if they keep moving, life works out. But they're petrified sometimes. So you have the disciples, the apostles following Jesus, getting in this tough spot. The dialogue that we're going to look at is, is posted between two mountains of revelations concerning Christ. 
on the one hand, you have Peter's great confession, which is a game changer. It's, if, if you watch the Gospels, when Peter makes his great confession on who he thinks the Christ is, that says there Philippi, all of a sudden the disciples take on a little more belief. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts teaching them stronger and plainly things. They even make comments like, he's no longer speaking to us in parables. He's talking to us plainly because things are getting ready to change and they need to be ready. In our text, Mark chapter 8. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, whom do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. And Matthew, he goes in a little bit deeper and says that you're, not, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then there's a little dialogue after that. And we realize that God had revealed that to Peter. And Jesus makes a couple other comments. But he closes with this statement. And he charged them to tell nobody about him. To tell no one about him. Now, some people say that he's using reverse psychology. You know, if you tell somebody not to tell something, they'll tell everybody. I, I beg to differ. Jesus is very serious when he tells them not to tell anybody at this point. Simply because his time is not had. When he goes to Jerusalem, he knows why he's going, but he goes on his own terms. He goes on his own terms. He goes when the timing is right, that God has planned before the foundations of the world, not when people drag him there. And that's his whole point. That's why he asked them not to say anything to anyone. So that's our front book in. Look at our back book in in chapter 9. Listen to this. This is six days after the conversation that we're going to look at. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up to a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. A lot of people get on Peter's case there because Jesus rebukes him a little bit, right? But watch this. Have you ever been in that situation before for less? Have you ever been somewhere where it's been silent and you just had to say something? Watch this. I say this gingerly. When I was in sales, this was the hardest thing for me to learn, but one of the most important things. After you've given your presentation and you're asking for the business, lay the pen down and say, all we need now is to okay this. And here's the rule. The first one talks loses. You know what most salesmen do? They go right back in there and try to resell them on all the great points. They already told them. No, no, it's decision time now. So here's the deal. You're hoping at this point that you get a sale. But if you don't, you want their true objection. Why? Because if you can handle it, you still might make the sale. You don't want to manipulate anybody. You're not trying to get anybody to buy anything they don't need. But the real facts are if they have true objections and you haven't explained it correctly, now you have that opportunity. And more times than not, it could move forward to a sale. But you lay the pin down on the table. You look them in the eye and say, all we need now is for you to okay this so we can move forward. He looks at the wall, I look at the wall. He looks down, I look down. Inside of me, who's a talker, I'm screaming, dude, say something. But on the outside, man, I'm cool as a cucumber. Why? Because there's nothing to be said at this point. I tell you, Peter was similar to that, but he couldn't contain himself. he just seen something unbelievable. He didn't know what to say. So he said, let's make three tents. Three tents. I mean, Peter knew, to be fair, that Elijah and Moses aren't in the same boat with Jesus, but yet at the same time, he didn't know what to say. He'd never seen anything like this before. And I think it's interesting that the scriptures give us that little bit of antidote. He didn't know what to say, so basically, he just said anything that came to mind. And a cloud overshadowed them. Listen to this. So Peter's talking about <laughs> building a tent, and watch this. And a cloud overshadows them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus. But Jesus, the Son of God, 
And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what, what listen to this, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. They have no idea. They knew it's something because Jesus said it. They just encountered God in a way they haven't yet. And Jesus says, don't tell anyone this. And yet in due time, it will make sense. Getting back to our text, let's look at this. Chapter 8. Peter's made the great confession. The other disciples are coming on board, starting to understand that Jesus has walked on water. He's fed people. He's healed the lame. The words we read about concerning John in prison. Enough to convict them that obviously he's somebody. Jesus foretells his passion. Jesus is getting very, very, very serious with them. Listen to what it says. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. He who, st- he who quieted the storm must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Ah, but thank God for these next words. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. He's talking like you and I now, regular, no parables, no hidden messages. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. In Matthew's account, again, who gives us a little bit more detail, he actually says that Peter said, God forbid, Lord, this shall not, hap- this shall not happen to you. Oftentimes people will say, there's Peter again sticking his foot in his mouth. Really? What would you do at that point? The Lord that you love, the Lord that took you from a little fishing place and a little fishing boat and saved your life and brought you in contact with the almighty true living God that you'd been talked about from the time you were born and the history of all your people. And now he's talking about that he's going to go, they're going to reject him. And not only they're going to reject him, they're going to kill him. What would you say? What would you say if your loved one was getting ready to sacrifice themselves willingly for somebody or something else? I personally think we get a little hard on Peter. I don't know how I would have handled it. But Peter didn't like it. He didn't like it. But man, Jesus doesn't spare him, does he? You see what Jesus says to him? Listen to what Jesus says to him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. Man, he cuts right to the quick. I'm about my father's business. I have to carry out my father's will. Peter, you're thinking purely from a man's perspective. I need you to start speak, start thinking from God's perspective. Man, that's not easy. That's where we live. It's not just looking at Peter now, it's addressing us. How often do we have that challenge and struggle where we're looking at it from man's perspective instead of God's perspective? There is no doubt that Peter meant well. There's no doubt that Peter was sincere. But Peter was dead wrong. And the Lord let him know so. The second portion. If any man would come after me, Jesus has been with them, he's been teaching them, and now all of a sudden, in a little bit of words, all of a sudden, he he starts to change the commitment that it takes to serve him. You give out an invitation, a lot of people are coming. You tell them there's work involved, and it'll shrink. You tell them the work is tough, and it'll shrink even smaller. Why? Because that's how life works. So Jesus is preparing them that if you're going to follow me, what you are, It's a very, very serious matter, and I have to do what? I have to get you prepared. Here's what he says. 
and calling the crowd to him with his disciples. So he's not only teaching his disciples, but he's teaching the crowd. And he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Wow. You don't hear that often. When's the last time you heard that? Deny yourself. No, we live in a world that always says it's all about me. Even on teams, it's all about me. Even in work settings, it's all about me. And many families, it's what? All about me. I don't want to deny me. I don't have a problem denying you. But that's what he says. Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's an interesting, isn't it? They still don't know exactly what the cross means here. They get the message that I'm supposed to do something. There's going to be some burden involved. There might even be some suffering involved. But they don't know exactly what that means yet on the cross. It's another one of those things that's going to hit them later. And then he says this, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What is, Jesus, help me out. What you, who loses his life will save it. Who saves his life will lose it for the gospel's sake. With Jesus, it's all or nothing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You seek God through Jesus, he'll take care of the rest. But if we get it backwards, we could have some challenges. Which brings us to the central point of my lesson. The next section. The next two verses. It was 1977. I was a young man in Dover, Ohio, living the way that I wanted to live, going in the direction that I wanted to go, doing what I wanted to do. You'll love this. <laughs> I'm almost ashamed to say it, but it's true. I only had one responsibility. Are you ready for this? My dad got home at 4 o'clock. And I had to be up and out of the bed before he got home. Now, that wasn't his rule. That was my mom's rule because she didn't want him to break my neck because I was out of high school and I wasn't working. Now, for good or better or worse, I wasn't working because I didn't need money. Because yours truly was making money in other ways that didn't involve going punching a time clock. So I could sleep whenever I wanted to. As long as I was up. Now, my mom didn't know all this. I don't, don't get me wrong here. My mom wasn't like, okay, Harry. No, no. My mom's point was, look, if you're not going to get a job, at least be out, up and moving before your dad gets home from work because I don't want him to break your neck and then I have to argue with him for disciplining you like I knew you always going to do. You know, this is the same dad who came in one time and looked at me like this. This is what he said a couple weeks later. Harry, uh, how, how long are you planning on living here? I said, well, you, you know what, dad? Actually, I was looking for a place as we speak. I wasn't, I, I'd still be there. I wasn't going to move out. Are you kidding me? Man, I had to, my family was there. My mom still cooked. Life was great. I wasn't going nowhere. But two weeks later, I had my own place. But that was my dad. Harry, how long are you planning on living there? Uh, well, actually, dad, I was looking for a place. But it's the same dad who taught me how to drive. I love my dad. You know how he taught me how to drive? Here's the keys. Go down over the hill and be careful. I, I'm not kidding. I went down over the hill, older brother came down the back way, we drove around, I got my license. Man, I, I, I love my dad. It was perfect for me. I can't speak for anybody else, but it was perfect for me. Now watch this. So yours truly is going to the public library every day. I decided that I'm going to go to the library every day for two hours. Sick and tired of hearing what people have to say about Jesus, I'm going to see what the Bible has to say about Jesus. So I'm going to the library every day to read this. And I read this verse, and it hits me between the eyes like a sledgehammer. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I backed up and read it again. My life, Harry Ogletree's life, is worth more than all the stuff in the world? Are you kidding me? I know what I'm doing. Hey, I'm not too far from the other people either. Don't misunderstand me. They're not doing what I'm doing, but they're not any closer to the Lord than I was. But watch this. And then I said, wait a minute, what, what does that mean? 
And then you come into the next question. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? I thought, what? That's back to me again. What, what am I going to give? What am I worth? And all of a sudden, man, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. God loves me more than all the stuff in the world that I'm trying to get. And there's nothing I can do on my own to earn his love. Yet he sent his son to die for me. I took it personally. Yeah, there were some changes in the household. There's some changes in the neighborhood. But that's what happens when you come face to face with Christ. You make changes in your life. So what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What will he give in exchange for his soul? What's the value of your soul and my soul? You and I are more precious and more valuable than anything else in this world. You and I have nothing to give in exchange except by faith our very lives to the Christ who died for us. God and Jesus makes us more important than anything else in the world. You and I are the pinnacle of God's creation. It has been bought and redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Therefore, the whole world would like, a poor, like to be a poor price for the soul of one man. Jesus' point is a dramatic one. There is nothing, not even the totality of human wealth and power, that would compensate for the loss of eternal life with God. Nothing is more valuable than spending eternity in heaven with God and Jesus. They tell me that Alexander the Great conquered the world. And at the age of 33, he sat in his tent and he wept because there was no more worlds to conquer. Alexander the Great, considered to be one of the greatest generals, conquerors of all time, wept. And yet the facts are his own personal soul was more valuable than the next kingdom he could have conquered. Oh, we get to hear the gospel. Sometimes we take it for granted, but how precious it is. Eternal words, words that can put us in the right relationship with the Father. You know what the final temptation was for Jesus? In Matthew 4, Satan took him up on a pinnacle. Showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, all these will be yours if you would worship me. Is that not what the same dilemma we face? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's the value that God and Jesus put on us. So let's look at it for just a second as we're wrapping up. Let's imagine, if you will, just for a moment what this might look like. You could sit on top of the world and control all its vast fortunes. You have all the silver. You have all the gold. You have the house of your dreams and multiple all over the world. You have servants. All you have to do is show up and come in, put down your menu, tell them what clothes you want. They're laid out, taken care of, pressed. You got the finest of animals, horses, dogs, whatever you prefer. You got the best clothes. You eat the best food. You travel in the best carriages. You have the best entertainment. You have your own symphony. You got a bowling alley. You have an actor's guild. You have movie products. You have publishers at your beck and call. The whole world, whatever it might be. Now listen to this. You know the man who built the more barns to store all this wonderful stuff? says that when he died, whose will these be? Now, here's a sobering thought. Here's a sobering thought. Do you realize that when all of us pass, our belongings are going to go to one of two sources? It's going to go to our family members, our loved ones, or it's going to go to strangers. That's it. That's it. That's a humbling thought, isn't it? But on the other hand, on the other hand, you have to work, you own a business, you got to be productive during that time, so you should be skillful at it. 
No one's talking about not being productive at what you do. We're talking about the value of your soul in the midst of all this stuff in the world. At best to family, at worst to strangers. Here's the point. It is to lead us to God and to Christ as the only way to the Father, to show us the value of salvation, the importance of eternal things, to make us alive to the things of God, and above all, to impress upon us the worth of the soul and the spiritual life. Think about what people throw their spirits away for. I mean, I look at my own challenges sometimes. You have challenges just like I do. You fall on your knees and you pray to God for forgiveness for stupid things, silly things, things that you spoke when you should have been listening. And yet, when you think about Christ and all he's done, and you try to share that with other people and the things that they value over that, amazing. Absolutely amazing. We're wrapping up. Here's what Jesus says at the end of that after asking those two great questions. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory with his Father and his holy angels. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying that you live in a corrupt, evil world. And if you're ashamed of me, the very Son of God who died for you and all those other people, I too will be ashamed of you. But he says it differently in Matthew. In another place he says, if you will confess me, Or acknowledge me before men, then I will what? Acknowledge you before my Father who's in heaven. That's the positive side of this. That's the positive side. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what's your greatest possession? Here we go. Your net worth is very, very important. Just like mine is. However, it is minuscule, very small compared to the value of God puts on your life and on my life. Because of what he's done for us and his son. Jesus says, I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. In this life and the next life. That's the value placed on me and placed on you. If we've generated faith in you this morning and you want to acknowledge Christ before us and then put him in, on in baptism as he states later in the book of Matthew, he states it in Mark. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We certainly want to give you that opportunity. But most importantly, we want you to leave with this morning how valuable you are to God and not only you, but our very own neighbors. If we can help you in any way this morning as we stand and sing the song of invitation,